I know you're gonna dig this. host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's Funk Chronicles Talk Back, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now, my studio guest is Kevin R. Johnson, guitar player and singer for the funk group Slave on the Showtime album. Hi, how are you? Well, hello, Mary. It's wonderful. It's uh, so good to have you here on the show and for us to have a conversation about Slave. Wonderful. Yes. And before I get started here, I wanted to show this is Slave, Slide, and Other Hits. It's a flashback, and it's the original songs you remember by the original artists you love. So here's good music right here. Slave. Tell me, Kev, how did you get started in the music business? Well, um, I did go to school. I went to Berkeley College Music, but before going oh, to I school, I want you to stop. Just stop, Kevin. <laughs> we're going to go back to when you yeah, were young. Just a young person. Yeah, when you were a young person, yes. how did you actually get interested in music? Well, at nine years old, I uh, got a bass guitar uh, for uh, Christmas. And I enjoyed playing music. Uh, we were listening to Archie Bell and the Drill, uh, what, as well what was as that song. What was the one uh, by the Archie Bell? Skin, not skin tight, but no. tighten up. Tighten up, yes. yes and tighten that was up. Uh, a famous bass line. So uh, we enjoyed playing that. So I learned that bass line, as well as also too. James Brown was uh, very uh, influential uh, to my uh, growing up. So um, I really took on music uh, at that age. Uh, then from that age, I got into art, uh, which I guess art was always uh, in my uh, field. Uh, after that, uh, at the age of 14, I picked up uh, the lead guitar and decided to really take on music seriously. So what's the difference between a lead guitar and a bass guitar? Uh, with a bass guitar, you have four strings, uh, and you mainly, majority bass players do not play chords. Um, some of our uh, professional guys now are playing chords, uh, and some of the guys years ago played chords. Uh, with lead guitar, you have six strings. Uh, you can also have a, a 12 string guitar as well too. Nowadays, also too, with bass, uh, they have five and six strings. Uh, the tone of the instrument uh, as bass is lower and lead is uh, more of a treble uh, instrument. So uh, I found myself uh, enjoying playing the lead guitar, so I took on that around the age of 14. Uh, got very seriously into it, started uh, studying. I started uh, taking lessons downtown uh, at Howard Music. I uh, had a teacher there. And uh, I graduated from Rolf High School. At a year, uh, I got advanced. And I spoke to my counselor and I said, well, I want to go to college. So she said, well, you have the you know, academics, uh, you have the credits, so why don't you do that? So I uh, 
decided I went to summer school and I applied for Berkeley College of Music and I was there in Boston. Berkeley College of Music is no joke when it No, it's no, not. That's like the Harvard. Yes, it of, is. That's like the Harvard or the Yale, the Ivy League school of music. Yes, it is. Yeah. It, it, it truly is. I think it's is. Berkeley, what, Juilliard? Yeah, Juilliard. Yeah, Juilliard is, yeah. is, is, is another famous uh, school. The, those are your uh, Ivy League uh, level when it comes to music. So you're, when you say right. Berkeley, yes. anybody knows their music know. uh oh, we're talking about Boston and we're yes. talking about serious. It's, yes, it, and it was very serious too. Uh, I went there and I met a lot of great musicians. Uh, they opened me up to a whole different world. Um, also, too, what's amazing is... Did you graduate from Berkeley? I took three years there, and then I went to New York. I graduated, though, in UCLA. Okay. And I went to uh, business, uh, uh, music business uh, in UCLA. Now, that's so, important, too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So I got around uh, development of music, of playing it, writing it, and then also the business side. Which is very important. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Very, ma very yes. important. Um, so you've had a round, you, your basics in music is well-rounded. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So you understand the business of music. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. And then, then the writing and the compos composition of it as well, too, which... Um, and, yeah, and production. Yes, production. Yeah. All these elements uh, really helped me, uh, Mayor, to uh, further my career in life. So who were your major influencers in music, too? Well, growing up, um, as I mentioned, Archie Bell, uh, Archie Bell, James Brown, but then also, too, I uh, got influenced by jazz. You know, I would listen to uh, Charlie Parker, I listened to Miles, I listened to John Coltrane. So mm -hmm. I, uh, because I went to school, I got a chance to uh, find not only the elements of funk music, but jazz, and then also too finding out that the elements of funk came from jazz, and jazz came from gospel. So I, uh, you know, I, I got a chance to be educated from the beginning elements, and then even from the beginning of elements of gospel. And that classical then music was the classical, root of all of it. The class, <laughs> and then our homeland, Africa. Oh well, you know when we. Not, not for us to get off into a discussion about music, but, yes. but um, classical music comes from, um, it has a, a very serious African root. Yes, it. it does. And, and so all of the music that we see today, I would say, morphs from the original music. Yes, that's yes. true, that's and, true. Uh, let's just say that. <laughs> yes, that's uh, true. Um, so you, your early experiences, when, when did you think that you kind of like turned semi-professional or or you just playing for your supper or how were you doing <laughs> it? Then? Well, once, once I did get up to Boston, I, I started working with guys and we started doing shows uh, around the Boston area. When I moved out to Los Angeles, it got very serious. It's uh, so when I started working with um, Doug and Gene Carr. And I worked uh, with Stevie Wonder. You know, I got a chance um, to work with him, and I started working with a lot of serious musicians. Uh, what I found, Mary, and I know you point this out all the time when you talk, is education is the key. And, you know, if I wouldn't have went to school, beforehand, you know, going to Boston and New York and then turning up into Los Angeles with education, uh, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish all those things. So education, you know, brought me to do a lot of those things. You know, so education, I would say, is a, a, a strong key that uh, really kind of moves us to the path of where we're trying to go in life. But I think especially in the music industry, it helps maintain us a sustainability. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, because, you, you know, if this is not working, you have another avenue to go That's to. That's true. That's and, true. And um, 
and, and I think that's what we're seeing in today's artists, that they're looking at the, the, the big picture of music and that's not true. just the artistry of playing an instrument. That's true. And that's, that's what true. I hear a lot out of you here. That's true. That's true. So tell me, how did you, just how did you come about to be a part of the group Slay? <laughs> <laughs> well, how I came to be a part, uh, Charles Carter and I, um, he was working with the group at that time. And we both had went to Berkeley uh, College of Music together. And I was living in Los Angeles, and the group was living in Florida. And they called me, and they said, Kev, uh, man, I know you can do the job. Uh, I'd love for you to you know, be a part. At that time, as I mentioned, I was working um, with Stevie Wonder. I was doing production work. And I told him, and I, I spoke to Stevie's uh, crew and everything. And I, I asked him, I said, man, you know, I, I've got this opportunity to go with my homeboys to uh, go on the road. And I was talking to Nate Watts, who's his music director now. And Nate said, well, yeah, Kev, that, that, that sounds pretty good, man. We'll, you know, we'll keep down the fort. And, you know, when you come back in town, we'll, you know, we'll record. And, and you know, you, you can still work with that. So uh, everybody was feeling, you know, pretty good on that side. Uh, so Charles had called me. The group had came out. They would, you know, the group at that time was very successful. They had the Stone Jam album out. Uh, the album was doing, oh, it was doing great, fantastic. Uh, it was reaching to gold at that time for, for the group. So uh, they were coming out to California at least uh, every couple of months. So they said, Kevin, we're going to come and get you. Now be ready. So I said, yeah, I know these guys. They're going to probably come and get me probably around April and Lo and behold, February turned up. They said, get your bags, let's go. So I took off from there, and it, it was a wonderful experience, you know, working with them. Uh, the great thing about the unit that I was with on the Showtime album, a lot of people don't look at, is we all were from Dayton, Ohio. See, the group that they started off had a mixture of people from New Jersey, Steve Washington and, and several other people uh, that were from New Jersey uh, and Dayton. But the unit that they assembled with the Showtime album, we were all from Dayton, Ohio. So that was a great feeling. And then not only that, we all kind of came from different backgrounds. Uh, so, that, excuse me, so you, re, you, you replaced uh, Mar Mark Hicks. Yes, I did. Yes, so, I did. So, uh, what did Mark go to do, and, and, what's your, and what was your relationship with Mark? Well, my relationship with Mark, I knew him uh, as, as a young person. As I said, once again, we all were from Dayton. Uh, I grew up with his brother, Mike. Uh, when I became a member, they actually had no clue of who I was supposed to replace. Uh, they were looking at either Mark or, or Danny Webster. And um, at the end of the shuffle, uh, Mark got, you know, was replaced. Uh, so me and Mark, you know, we had no ill feelings about it because we were close friends. Not only that, uh, what I like to bring up about this, because a lot of people don't know that relationship is when I left the group I actually came back here and I worked with Mark uh, to help him assemble you know some of the things that he was doing so we were always uh, good friends and then with Danny uh, I, I grew up with him uh, actually um, influenced him a lot musically wise so we were all close friends so um, it was wonderful and then the, the great thing also, too, when I came aboard, as you will see with a lot of the photos, when we were uh, at Ebony or when we got the key to the city of Mayor uh, McGee, uh, Drac was there as well, too. So we all were there as a unit, and I feel really good because uh, we were, you know, we were close friends. And so it didn't take nothing away from replacing him. You know, we just brought in a new sound. An exchange. Yes, An yes. An exchange. Yes. You know, and, and I think uh, in most instances, musicians generally have, because it is a changing area. Yes, and, that's true. And so 
m most, most musicians, I would uh, uh, think, have relationships because today I'm here and the opportunity may come up for tomorrow yes, and I'll true. be there. And so yes. when you start, you don't want to use the term loyalty to in, in the music arena because it's such a musical chair uh, event of opportunities. That's true. That's yeah. true. And and so you know that that to have loyalty to someone could really be to your downfall because you might miss a lot of good. And, and I think people expect yes. for you to move around. I mean, they don't may not want you to, but that's true. But they kind of expect it. So. With, 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 with the group Slave, tell me about three highlights of when you were touring with Slave that you were saying that you could think right now and say, these three things, there's probably a whole lot more, <laughs> but these three things are the most unforgettable things I can remember about this tour. Well, you know, when we did the uh, album was wonderful and we got a call to go out west from Florida to fly first class. <laughs> you know, first class to uh, go do uh, Soul Train and Don Kirsten rock concert. Well, that was a wonderful week because uh, we had just recorded the album, you know, and they were saying, you know, a lot of great things about it. And once we got out there, our first uh, taping was with Don Kirshner. Uh, we did it that evening. Uh, we had a break. Uh, and then we had also to a, a press party for the album. What was great about the press party is they combined it with Luther Vandross uh, with his Never Too Much album. So that was just a turnout in California. And the greatest thing, what was really, you know, a, a time for me was that I met uh, Ron Isley. And Ron Isley came to the press party and he tugged on my shoulder and he said, you know, because I was part of the group, and he said, man, man, I'm happy for you guys. I said, wow, man, it's great that you came. He said, man, I wouldn't miss this for the world. You guys are my homeboys. So, you know, getting that kind of love from, you know, greats like Ron and his brother uh, Kelly and Rudolph was there, so which those two guys are no longer uh, with us. You know, that was, a wonderful, wonderful exchange. Um, secondly, uh, was getting, like I said, the key from Mayor McGee, the first black mayor of Dayton. I mean, that's, you know, historically uh, wonderful. Uh, the third one, I would say, because uh, there's a lot of them, is meeting uh, Don Cornelius. And Don was very nice to me. Um, what happened was after we did the taping. You know, I asked them, you know, if I could get a copy of the show. They sent me the full tape for free. So I've been able to uh, share this with the, the band members and keep it, you know, with our archive. So um, with majority of the people that I've met in this journey, you know, being with the group, even with the record company, um, meeting Henry Allen, uh, which I was just talking to someone about Henry. A lot of people, uh, he was the owner of Atlantic Cotillion. Uh, Henry's originally from Springfield, Ohio. So that was, that, you know, that took me away that this guy had done so many things. Woodstock, worked with Aretha Franklin, and worked with Atlantic Records for many years, uh, had been from Ohio. So. Uh, just the love that I've, I've gotten from so many people, uh, you know, being from the group. I, that's all exciting. Yes, you know, yes. Yeah, I mean, just to think about the three highlights there, and and uh, and each one that you name was just uh, exciting. Yes. So, but but then again, too, on the other <laughs> hand, yes, uh, being on the road, you 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 have uh, you, you, three things that uh, you're saying like. I don't know how I lived through this, but yes. we did. Yes. Uh, you know, whether it was um, all your springs, all your strings breaking, or yes. or three, three, tell tell us three interesting things that uh, they aren't the the good stuff, but you know, but they're the, like you know, people to know like what it's like to be on the road and these yes. things happen to yes. you. Yes. Well, so give me three of them. <laughs> 
Well, uh, I would say this is traveling. You know, we, we, at that time, it was very extensive for us. So we had very short time to spend with our families, um, consistently uh, in and out of town. Uh, the great thing th that came out of that, though, uh, the positive plus is because the guys were from Ohio, we did stop in Dayton a lot, and uh, so I did get a chance to, you know, spend time with my family. But there were times that, you know, we were out on the road and uh, just missing them. For the most part, uh, I would say this, uh, when I was with the unit, um, the business was pretty good. Um, later on, the group kind of sagged, but when I was there, uh, we had wonderful times, and we had some good times. So when you exited, did you all ever go to Europe? You know, I've been to Europe, but I uh, went. Did the slave ever make it to Europe? Uh, they did. They did. But you weren't with them? No, I, was with, I wasn't with them. They had a unit, uh, actually, that had Billy Beck. I remember that, uh, talking to them. They had Billy Beck went uh, with them. And then I think they also went to Japan. Uh, as well too. So they did some uh, overseas touring a little later on um, in in their venture. You know, one of the things that's been uh, that that we've noticed that so many uh, African American uh, musicians and bands sure. get more appreciation in in Europe. Oh, you're and, right. And especially right. in Japan. Yes, you're right. And, you're right. And, and most of them get their recognition there, and then they bring it back. That's to true. That's true. The uh, United States. You're it, you're it, you're 100 percent right. It, I don't understand it, but that's the way it seems to to go at the time. Tell me about when it came time for you to leave Slave. I mean, what 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 what, what did you do? You know, how do you how do you know when it's time to go? Well. Um, we were having some confrontation with the label. The label wanted to actually sign everybody, um, and the deal that uh, Slave had was not a good deal. Uh, a lot of people will recall that uh, Arrington uh, developed uh, his Hall of Fame. So I left a little bit before Arrington. Uh, I was working, like I said, with Stevie Wonder and, and several people out west. Uh, I was seeing that things weren't moving financially <laughs> in, in the right direction, so I decided to, you know, I was living in, in Los Angeles, so I, I stayed back there. Um, what was amazing, I was talking to Arrington when they were building the Hall of Fame, and we were talking about, you know, how they were about to do that. We even, you know, what was amazing, I guess when you're in this music business, you get a chance to talk about several other things. We're even talking about um, Heat Wave. And when Heat Wave was uh, uh, doing their thing, and the Off the Wall album, we were talking about Michael and Rod Templeton and how um, Heat Wave had the opportunity to do some of those songs that uh, Rod Templeton had wrote for Michael. Uh, but. Uh, they decided not to do them. So, we, you know, we were, we were in a conversation about where we all were kind of going direction-wise. So that's how you left? Yes, I, I, I decided to uh, go back to uh, Los Angeles and, and work, because at that time, like I said, uh, Arrington was, was seeing his direction and, uh, you know, others were seeing other direction as well, too. So I decided to to move uh, forward uh, to what I was doing out in Los Angeles. And steady? Well, no, to work with uh, major major people, like I said, with Stevie. Well, with, I'm with saying Stevie. it gets steady work. Yes, yes, yeah. steady, yes, yeah, steady, consistently, yes. Yeah, because the road, yes, you're right, the road you're is right. hard, and, uh, and I still think that goes back to, Kevin, that you having had the opportunity yes. and the experience to not only do school but to do business. That's true. You you, you see you, you saw the whole experience from a different approach. That's you're you're absolutely right. I mean right. That, that that's uh, totally different from from a person who only sees the the musician part. That's true. And they, they don't see the big picture that's because true. they only see their piece. And um, and, and but today in today's uh, 
music world, we're starting to see more people be involved um, in the total aspect That's of true. music. That's you know, true. I, I recall someone when we, you know, that I've interviewed people who, that the reason why some of their opportunities couldn't um, expand any further, because they couldn't read music. I mean, they got music that's, by ear. And, that's true. And, and, uh, and, and so it, it limited their ability to do things because they that's right. couldn't read music. And we can recall so many times growing up, you know, so and so plays music by ear. Yes, by yes. ear. And we, we, you know, we learned that what Aretha Franklin didn't learn how to play music till she was really grown. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, so, um, th th so I'm just trying to compliment your advantages there on, oh, yes, on that. Oh, yes, I appreciate that, man. Um, and and so, some of the groups that you've been with since then since you left, when 1982, when you left the group, uh, you helped them write some music, did they ever use it? Yes, um, I, I uh, have one song on there, it's called Funkin' Town. Funkin' uh, Town. Yes, but, but then uh, what I was doing, like you said, because I, I went to school for that, I was writing uh, with, with Stevie Wonder, I was writing, actually, um, before I got with the group, I was actually supposed to be a writer for Solar Records. Oh. <laughs> and um, what happened was the group uh, came with the offer and uh, some of the guys at Solar were kind of disappointed that I went <laughs> with the group, but I, I still maintained uh, writing. So I was involved into that. I was in, involved into arranging and things of that sort. So as you said, by going to school, I had more of a aspect of just being just an artist and just playing an instrument, I, I had more opportunities that were thrown uh, to me. So uh, I have been very blessed in, in many ways. Um, around the, the years 85, 90s, around there, uh, you started producing your own music. So what all did that entail? Well, I uh, was uh, doing some work uh, with a female out of, um, Ohio, and uh, the project ended up into Pablo Davis, who managed uh, Midnight Star, oh. um, and the deal, and I heard that you also uh, interviewed them as well, too. Uh, that was fun, uh, because that also that project involved uh, Billy Beck uh, from the Ohio Players. I was working with Billy a lot, uh, very talented uh, guy from Youngstown, and I could see how the Wild Players music really developed when I worked with Billy. I, I really enjoyed that relationship. Um, also, too, another talented uh, musician uh, that I uh, had met while I was living in California was Billy Osborne uh, from LTD. Uh, at that time, Billy was actually uh, a staff writer for Ray Charles, so I ended up uh, doing some tracks on uh, Ray's album uh, for uh, for that particular project. I also uh, produced an, an album uh, that's uh, been released. Uh, it did very well for me. Uh, I had Patricia Russian on it, I had Billy Beck, I had uh, Kevin Tony from the Blackbirds. I, I ensembled a lot of people um, that were friends of mine that I knew that had talent and I wanted to bring a sound uh, that was very unique uh, using uh, these particular people. And then also too, I used uh, several people from Ohio. Uh, I used Dean Hummins, uh, that's uh, my cousin from Sun. Uh, I used a couple of other guys that were from Ohio as well too, that were, you know, brought a, a fantastic sound to, to the albums. So um, that was very fun. Now I have a question to ask. I always like to know that. Uh, interesting that when you bring your friends to to do um, albums or CDs or sure. whatever we want to call them nowadays. Sure. Um, do they get royalties too, or do you pay them yes. to do it? Or yes. How, how, yes. How how is that done? I mean, I you know, and you'll say see like uh, duets with so and so yes. and and. Um, 
how, how's, how's that work? Well, you know, I, I'm a fair and honest uh, business person. And so what I did is I put a budget together and I uh, hired them. And I paid them and also, too, for what they write uh, and arranged on. You know, they got credit and everything, and they still you do receive royalties. So I, um, I guess I developed uh, that, once again, from going to school <laughs> and learning, you know, that if you do these things right, then you keep business relationships and friendships right because, you know, these are some of your best friends and if you treat them wrong, and if you do something wrong in business, which we sometimes hear, whether it be in music business or any other type of business, it really ruins the relationship. And you never know when you may need to go back to that person. So I've always you know, kept a really good rapport uh, with all the guys that I've worked with, you know, all of them, all of them from day one. You know, that's something that, once again, because I went to school, I, I was taught that you get paid for this. You don't come in here and you don't do this for free. You know, this is something that uh, I know we don't need to elaborate on it, but for our people, you know, that has been a problem. You know, is that we've never really known the business and so many. Well, we musicians. need to elaborate on that, yes, Kevin, yes, because yes. you know we're, we're looking now today. Uh, I, I think it was a Sly, uh, who was living in a trailer. Yeah, he's just now yes. won his um, the, uh, lawsuit yeah, it's, it's, on, it's, on it's, back it's a, royalties. You know, you, you little Richard for many yes, years fought, that's true. and so many of, of them us. Yes, that. It never did, did happen. happen. And, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a sad, it's a sad journey. And one of the things I always t tell people that, uh, as much as you love to hear Whitney Houston sing, "I'll Always Love You," right. uh, Dolly Parton likes that song so, better <laughs> yes. because she wrote it. That, that's right. You're and, right. And so sometimes the the music industry, that's you true. know, the writer. Yes. The writers, uh, right. I mean, like Burt Bacharach and all the of those kind of folks the out there, they're making the money. money. That's true. They're making the money, that and you may not true. never know their name. Yeah, that's right. But they that's know true. they sing the song. That's true. That, that every time you sing that song, that's they true. get a little something, something. That's so, true. So um, that's true. writing, writing and publishing is huge no, in, it's, it's in, very in huge. the music business. Yeah, the business and is. And so is, many is, folks get distracted because they want to be. Seen. Yeah, that's right. They want to be seen. That's right. But that's true. Uh, it, it's that. But that's why you read like where the Stevie Wonders they write music that's and, true. and some of their songs and they spread that's them right. around. Yes. And and that's uh, that's extremely important. Oh, it's very, Mayor. You you've hit on a, a note that, um, like I said, our people have suffered for many years, oh, especially yeah. a lot of the blues guys. Uh, uh, I was reading stories where some of those guys were paid in just liquor to go in to do it. And what's bad is their music is still being sold and it's being heard. And, and one of the uh, traumatic things about this business is that sometimes people don't make sure that their relatives or their, their kin do get the royalties of this because what happens is what we were talking about with the writers and the publishers uh, that eventually when those people die their family members take over and then once again it's a whole traumatic thing that a lot of people uh, really suffer you know so I mean the the, the terms starving harvest uh, really comes to pass when you see that and the story that you hear with some of these guys that have done sessions and and they die penniless and broken it's a really it's a it's a tragic story about the the industry so you know leading up to um your relationship to we talked about slave but we can't talk about slave without talking about mark Adams. yes correct so Let's talk about that. Oh, Mark was um, was a very close friend. Uh, I knew him as a, as a young person, and also too, um, 
when I became a member, you know, he really uh, took a shining to me. Uh, he knew that I went to school, and so um, he'd always say, hey, Kev, you know, what is, what is this, you know, while we were on the road? And so we would always joke and, and things of that sort. Uh, what I had fun with Mark was when we did this Showtime album, uh, it was the unit of me, Mark, um, Steve Arrington on drums, and then we had uh, Sam uh, Carter playing piano. So we were the nucleus of the tracks. So we were, you know, we were working together. And majority of the songs, too, um, which a lot of people don't know about Slave, uh, Mark was the creator of a lot of those songs, even to uh, the time that uh, when we uh, did the Showtime album, you know. So once again, um, Mark was a very huge, talented guy, and then not only that, his sound that he brought to the instrument uh, to this day, a lot of uh, people uh, love, you know, what he what he did. You know, when we talk about Mark and, you know, like Mark's death was March the 5th, uh, 2011. Yes. Then um, Mark Hicks of yes. the group Slave passed away June 14th, 2011. So yes. it, and you had mentioned Mark Hicks earlier. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, that, that was something that, that was kind of a sad thing because um, both Marks, uh, we really didn't expect that to happen. Uh, with uh, Mark Adams, what's amazing, uh, Mayor, is he actually called on, called me on the fourth. We were looking to do a recording, uh, as well as also too, we were working together with his fiance, Free. Uh, so we were working on projects, and uh, then Free called me. Uh, on the 5th when he passed away in the morning. And she was very hysterical on what had happened. It was uh, really a tragic loss for both of them. They, they both were very young guys, uh, very talented in their rights, you know. So uh, we lost uh, 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 some, some very good people. You know, uh, one of the things I heard you say is that Mark had written, arranged, and did some music and, and there's probably no royalties out there. There probably should be, but are there? Yes, there, actually, there are. There are royalties that, um, see, when I was working with Mark, I was actually, because of, you know, my uh, business. Your background. Yes. yes. We're just going to yes. your background. Yes. 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 So I was snooping around, so I was actually finding a lot of um, money that was, uh, that was due to him. What happened was there were deals that he had signed. Um, also, too, Mark uh, had a problem with the IRS as well, too. But uh, as we know, you know, the IRS, you don't have to pay all your life. So therefore, there are some things that uh, there, are, there are royalties that are out there. I mean, that's the amazing thing about the group, uh, Mayor, and what we were talking about, our industry, um, our business consistently goes on even after we pass. So if you don't take care of your business while you are alive, then you do miss out on a lot of this and the money goes to other people. You know, so that's the sad, you know, the sad thing about this, that you have to put all your ducks in a row to make sure that, you know, once you pass on, then your family members, you know. Uh, Whoever you choose. Choose, yeah, yeah. 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 So, because this is a legacy that continuously moves on. I mean, to this day, we're still seeing royalties. You know, Mark has passed, both Marks have passed, and their, their royalties are there. You know, now whoever, well, whether, whoever is, but who gets them is another the, thing. Yeah, that's right. And whoever is taking care of their affairs. You know, I mean, you have to uh, dig into it. You have to sometimes call. Sometimes you have to get a lawyers to uh, sift out. You know, but the, you know, there there are things that are happening. Our music consistently is going. Uh, our, you know, with. Uh, Serious, you know, Sirius is playing a music uh, with the 
uh, retrospect of all these stations. Uh, there's royalties coming from there. There's royalties coming from shows. There's, you know, there's constantly people are constantly using our music into movies. So, you know, those are, uh, are money that, uh, as, as they say, when your likeness is used, that's, uh, you know, money that is due to you. So you have to certainly keep uh, uh, adjusted to this. You have to watch who you deal with businessly wise. You, you may think that sometimes you, you're choosing the right person. You, you have to, you know, you have to sift, you know, sift out who you're dealing with, you know, because some, sometimes people will say they're looking out for you and then, you know, they're, they're actually ripping you off. You know, so it, it, it's you. You have to really kind of do your homework. You know, when it comes to uh, business, and and you have to be on your toes. <laughs> well, and 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 but I and, and I think that's why I wanted us to pause and talk about this because sure, sure. You know, we got Mark, who who died in March, we, and we don't know how that's gonna you know how that's gonna work out because sure. we, and, and not only in the music industry, just in a plug on about life. Yes. Um, you know, you have people go around and say, oh, I'm gonna give you my, I, like I can say, I'm gonna give you all my hats yes, or something yes. like that. But if I don't put it in writing and I don't put it in, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that's right, that's it, right. I mean, it's just, that's, that's it's true. just like when, you know, it just comes and it goes. And and so, you know, the thing with Mark Hicks and, and even, even if it adds to be as a group that needs to go after this, that's well, true. If they haven't left anybody in charge, then you're going to see bickering among among the relatives of a group before you can get to a group. That's and right. then finally, you know, we had like Delbert Taylor, who who died three years later, uh, was a part of the the group in uh, August 24th, which is just recently 2014. So in a period of like three years, you had three. Uh, significant members yes, of that's Slave that's passed true. away. So tell me about Delbert's death. Well, Delbert, me and Delbert were, were very close friends. Um, we used to talk all the time. Uh, what uh, was good about Del is that we were talking about a lot of these you know, and, and so we were, once again, because of my hat in this, you know, a lot of the guys uh, reached out to me and uh, I was helping Delbert, you know, get a lot of his affairs together. So at this time, I'm actually working with his uh, wife. Um, she's over his affairs now, so I help her and I've been assisting her getting, you know, a lot of his royalty. So we're looking into a lot of things now. Uh, with uh, money that's due, and we're we're, we're being successful. We we're, we've got some uh, people to uh, actually uh, fork over some some of his royalties, and and we're looking to actually um, have some of his music. Uh, he was actually with, uh, which was great with. Uh, with uh, Delbert, he worked with uh, Gil Scott Heron. Oh. And uh, he actually um, worked with them. So I'm working on some elements with that as well, too. So uh, I've been instrumental with kind of uh, the helping his family as well, too. So, you know, you, you've had this wonderful experience, and, and, and music is like one of those things that gets in your system. Uh, and well, and it's not going anywhere. Yes, you're gonna that's keep right. on, You're going to go until you drop. And so what's the future with Kevin R. Johnson? What, what's Kevin R. Johnson's future? Well, I've, I've been doing some marketing. You know, uh, that has been, I guess, uh, Mayor, that's been an eye-opening. Uh, as we mentioned around the year 19, I would say late 1990s, um, I started marketing. And then I, I crossed the, I crossed the the other side of the fence, which you know once again, as an artist, you you think about the music, you think about the producing, you think of those elements. Uh, I started dealing with the guys that started marketing, so I started reaching out to them. I started talking to them about how this element of, okay, you know, after this music is produced, you know. What are the, some of the steps? Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I, I reached out to our, the owner 
of our, our record uh, label was Henry Allen before Henry passed away. And I actually started talking to him. I started working with him side by side to understand the business. And then he started pointing me out to guys that were actually marketing our music. And so I started rubbing shoulders with them to start learning, okay, now let me know what these elements of how you, how you market these products. So I started my own uh, marketing firm and then... Uh, What's it called? Uh, it's called uh, JMR uh, Company. Okay. And so uh, since then I've actually helped uh, several people market their books. Such uh, as? Um, I have a lady that's out of uh, Maryland. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Lynn Johnson. And Lynn, um, she's living out in California now. So she has a radio station. I've worked with her for several years. I also worked with another lady uh, named Lynette. Um, she had a book that uh, was assisting the Katrina victims. Uh, I worked with her for several years. We actually have been back and forth to New Orleans to actually assist a lot of the families that were devastated from the uh, Katrina. So um, I've worked in several other aspects. I've got another gentleman down in uh, Georgia, this young gentleman that uh, I really love working with him now. He's with 6103 Entertainment. He works with the young guys, so uh, uh, I'm enjoying working with them now. And. Um, you, you know they're they're my family, so. Uh, so how, how does the marketing, how does the marketing work? Well, the marketing has been very fun because it, it's another aspect. Uh, we're helping produce uh, their products and getting their products into the stores. We're learning how um, uh, you know you 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 piggyback on other products. Uh, we're actually, I've learned how to uh, get uh, our products into filming, you know, into a film project, you know, so um, that element's uh, a wonderful element, Mayor, and, and what's amazing about that element of the industry, that part of the industry is actually a, a higher revenue than the others because what is happening with the industry because we've got the new technology and things of this sort people are making products but what we're finding is so many people don't know how to market their products so they're relying on marketing firms to market their products so this uh, element of uh, this facet of the business has taken off even more because there's so many great products that are out there, but so many people don't know how to market it. So they're knocking on our doors, asking us to, hey, you know, I know you've done this with Slave. I know you work with these record companies. So I, I get more people coming to me now than ever because you know, I'm, I'm getting so many great, great, I mean, products that people have videos, they have everything ready to go, but they just need that knowledge. And because they don't have that knowledge, they don't have the schooling, they need someone like myself and the firms that I'm working with to help, you know, make their product uh, successful. It sounds like something really exciting. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's fun. Do so you have I, anything else that you're doing? I mean, that's just one thing. I, <laughs> well, that, that in itself keeps me busy. Okay. Yeah. I, oh, and also, too, I, I do work uh, with my church. Uh, it's out in Wilmington. Uh, I do uh, play with them. You know, so they keep me busy every Sunday, you know, and they do things. But, um, yeah, the, the marketing has kept me busy. I, I do have a couple of projects. I'm working with Free. I'm working with Delbert. Um, and Delbert's I, uh, wife. Yeah, yeah, with Delbert's wife. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that, make, make sure that's clear. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, okay. with Delbert's wife. Uh, and, um, yeah, it, but, but with these projects, they're, they're keeping me f f uh, very busy. Yeah. The last thing I want to um, ask you is that why do you believe that the 
it is important to have the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center, and especially in Dayton, Ohio. Well, you know, um, I think it's very important because of what we have done, all of us, uh, Ohio players, uh, Heat Wave, uh, Lakeside, ourselves, uh, all the music is, is very vital and it's very important because, you know, it's, it's our youth that needs to know, and as well as the world needs to know uh, what we did do. You know, as I was speaking to someone about this, what was amazing about the groups ourselves, people probably don't realize this, we all individually had our own sound, and not only that, we all individually went and got our own deals. You know, from a lot of the places that I know, a lot of the musicians that I've met, uh, some places, uh, some of the groups piggybacked. What they did is one act uh, made it, and then what they did is they produced their own albums. Uh, and they kept a row of talent, like what Motown did. Uh, what we uh, did in Dayton is we all individually out seats our own deals. What some people have said to me with this is, man, you know, you guys have, have your own Motown, you know, that you guys did in Dayton. You know, I think with the structure of the guys that, because we were all individuals, we never thought of that, but uh, we did something very uh, unique. Uh, at one particular time when we were in the industry, uh, they were looking at us in Ohio seeking acts because of what we brought to the forefront. I remember reading um, when uh, Roger uh, passed away, he said the reason why he moved to Dayton is because of all the success of the artists that came out of Dayton. So, you know, it, it really was a very big thing that we put together. Uh, so it's very important that we keep this uh, history alive. I want to thank you so much, Kevin R. Johnson, for being with us today. And this is Ryan McLenn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles Talk Back. Until next time, keep it funky.